We needed somebody to help us take that next step. And it was through a series of associations that we became acquainted with the work of Dr. Ford and Dr. Whiting. And the rest, as I would say, is history. We're all interested in closing the achievement gap. We have no choice but to close the achievement gap. And when Dr. Whiting and I met, uh, we were especially focusing on African-American males because in just about every school district, they're the ones who are least likely to succeed. With research showing young black males performing significantly below their classmates beginning as early as second grade, the Orange County Public Schools set out to understand the problem and devise a plan to attack it. The result was the Scholar Identity Institute in the summer of 2014. The program was described by some as a brotherhood of scholars. Our children of color, our children that uh, speak English as a second language, need to have very uh, conscious and direct attention. So we simply went about the business of asking ourselves, what could we do about that? So I'm glad that the district recognizes um, that we have to close the achievement gap. And there are many solutions, um, but one is, uh, we believe, the Scholar Identity Model and the Scholar Identity Institute. The point of truth that led us to the Scholar Identity Institute was the uh, disproportionately low participation of minority children in our academically gifted programs. I knew coming in that the first thing that I needed to do was build bridges and relationships with the minority community and to just start a conversation. So we created a report that was sort of the superintendent's annual report on the condition and progress of minority children in Orange County. And we presented that to the NAACP. We then worked with the NAACP to create a, a group of individuals that would meet with regularity to discuss what it was we were doing to address those disparity concerns. We called that the Minority Advisory Committee. And we talk, we discuss, we look at the data, and we talked about solutions and ways that we could uh, do better by our young people in this county. I guess I want to reinforce, again, the importance of how involved many people in the community have been and getting the parent buy-in, um, how important it's been, and that, again, it just wasn't something to do for a week and then um, you know, take it off our to-do list. We wanted to do it. Uh, we didn't know quite how we were going to get the money, but then, I don't know, out of nowhere something said, the money is out there in your community. All you have to do is go and ask for it. Community buy-in was incredible. The community support was incredible. We had or, um, constituents from multiple types of organizations saying, we got to jump on board and close this achievement gap. Everybody needs to be involved. So it resonated. It was like becoming more systemic and a community-wide initiative. We met with the pastors of more than 30 churches in the Orange County vicinity. And uh, these pastors truly came on board. The churches, their congregation, members in the community. Uh, people wanted to know more about the Institute. And not only do they want to know more about the Institute, but they wanted to be a part in where this county was going. This community is to be commended for coming together in a partnership for the students. And I'm a strong believer that um, we need people in our communities to be passionate about our children. And this project, uh, when I first heard about it, I realized that this is a strong example of a passionate community. Armed with Ford and Whiting's research on the Scholar Identity Model, donations totaling over $10,000 and hundreds of prayers, the school and community joined forces to introduce 39 young black men to the challenges of life as a scholar. I like that we, that this experience for them took place on a, uh, a university campus. It, it, um, it really got them to begin to look at uh, 
what the possibilities were or are. And they began to see uh, what education can do for them. And when they started talking about their goals, we could really begin to see that education was a part of what they wanted to accomplish. It was, it was an amazing experience, just seeing all, like the college life and just visiting places like I only see once in my lifetime if I don't make the best of my opportunity. It felt like I was actually going to college, going, going to learn, going to strive. And I felt I was happy and ready when I actually get to go to college. The UVA campus, it was, it was great. I think it was the highlight of my trip. It helps you to be able to like see what you can be and what you can do when you grow up and even now to prepare for that. And it just kind of like an eye opener and like a kind of like a sidewalk to show you which way to go. When you actually sat there for the first day, the day, that Tuesday we went in and went to go experience it, that first day you really sit there, I think that's the part when you're like, I did it, I did it, I'm here, this is, this is what I want to do. I finally did what I needed to do. It was fun because we got to tour the campus and see what was around the campus. We saw some people and they talked to us about what it was and what they did there. It was really interesting. I, I actually liked it. The nine constructs or principles of the Scholar Identity Model form the backbone of the Scholar Identity Institute's curriculum. Each day, the young men were introduced to two of these principles, one in the morning and another in the afternoon. The constructs move in a specific pattern, each building on the other to support success. While at the university this summer with the 39 young men, we focused a lot on those constructs. I think the one of the strongest things that it that it did give the young man was that idea of self. It means to me that I have to know myself before I can go out and judge others or go find other things to do in my life. It's like challenging yourself to do something. Like you can't say that you can't do it. You got to say that you will do it. So then you got to make like whatever you're saying that you can do actually happen. Future orientation was something that really uh, caused uh, the young men to reflect on what they say they want to post, they, what they want to be, as opposed to what they're doing to make that spoken desire become reality. If you have an education, you can do a lot in your life. Like, I want to go to college. I want to be a blueprint designer because I like drawing and sketching. And I want to go to like a four-year college so I can be better at what I do now. I can't just focus on what's going on now, but I also gotta think about my plans ahead of time. So I'll be able to be organized and know, at least have an idea of how and what I will do as I grow. It will help them and it will help them plan for the future. And like, it might help them think more about what they're doing and it might help them like pick their grades up. As we studied that concept, uh, the young men were able to see that uh, with every choice we make has a consequence that goes with it. If you want to like, go outside and like have fun with your friends, like but you have homework to do or something like that, like you make that sacrifice to do your homework instead of going outside and play. Like doing your homework instead of watching more TV and help your parents out instead of just having a whole bunch of free time. Well, I had to make a lot of sacrifices to be successful in language search, science, social studies, and math. I had to give up free time, game playing, and start to study, read, and practice my skills. So, like, Friday nights, you know you got a big test Monday. Instead of going to a football game or going to a party, hanging out with your friends, you should take the time to study hard so you can pass 
that test on Monday. The young man giving examples of how they would now make sacrifices, not just in school, but in the home as well. So they would give examples of how they've been upset with a parent, one of their parents, for asking them to do something they didn't want to do. And then they realize their, their mom, their father, their parents have made sacrifices for them. So if their family can make sacrifices so they could do well, they'll make sacrifices to help their parents. Now, what really stands out for me is that these young men um, do not blame their parents, their teachers, or the community for any um, failures, if you will, or for any times that they struggle. The young men who have a strong sense of internal locus of control, they understand that it's all about me. They believe they are responsible for their education. And I take control of what I have to do, like my homework, my study. I just want to show them that I can do the best that I could possibly can do. We again talked uh, about um, the need to be sure of yourself, to, to be strong enough in yourself, again, to seek help as needed. Uh, and not to worry about what other folks are thinking about you, but to go out and get everything that you need to be successful. Uh, this started a while back. I stopped asking teachers for help when I start asking questions, but this helped me get back into my routine and ask for help. I said to myself, this would really help me. And when I, and then the, the day comes, I were able to succeed in life. What we shared with them is that it's okay to be a member of a club. It's okay to be a fraternity brother. It's okay to want to be popular, but you have got to keep the academics in your, um, your need to achieve as the main thing. And, and clubs and groups should not uh, be your identification. You need to be able to identify yourself and not tie your identity to a club. Don't be a follower, be a leader, just do all that stuff. Don't be around the wrong people. You might need to study more than to do like football or any sport, like focus on your schoolwork than doing another activity. Your education is more important than your hobbies and what you like to do. If you have the need for achievement, you're doing things that you're supposed to do at a certain time, you're supposed to do it. Put your academics before your athletics and then you'll go farther in life. I mean, you don't have to give them up, but you have to focus more on your academics to go somewhere than focus on your athletics. I mean, you can, you can do both, but academics comes first. Like if people are like telling you like to drink beer or something, and you know that'll mess up your career, but all your friends are doing it, how to like back away from that situation and stuff. In order for you to proceed and make the best of what you want to be in life, you have to give up the little things. My dad, he wanted a pair of shoes and told him that's need for affiliation and not need for achievement. So he was asking me what it was about and I was telling him. So he told me that next time I wanted something, I had to tell him what that was. So many times our young men are, are, are so desirous uh, of the idea of fitting into a group or fitting into something, and, and they let that um, play a greater role in their development than academics. And I wanted them to understand, in order to be a whole person, you have to belong to something where you contribute to an entire group, but you also have to spend time contributing to, to making yourself a better person, a more whole person, a more well-rounded person. The whole concept or the whole experience of the week led them to start to really engage that whole concept of I could be the scholar that we're talking about. And it made it real for them. One thing that really stuck out there and which you would hear every single day was to cogitate, which was a um, meaning for thinking about your thinking. So like before you say something, you would think and then you would say it or before you were to answer a question on a test, you would think about it and then you would pick it. So then you can understand that you know what you're doing before you actually do it. 
Well, I loved it because you get to see um, college students working in their classrooms. You act like, I just want to be them. I want to go to college just like them. Every time when I focus on grades, I always read the Scholar Creed to make me prep up for a test or something like that. If you do something, you want to be the best you can possibly be. And you wouldn't want to settle for anything less than the best. I want my GPA to be a 4.0 and I wanted to go to college at JMU and I want to get a degree from there. Because like when you go in that classroom, nothing can stop you. I remember we were talking about um, why it was so important, I think, to have African American males be a part of this project. And what made me so happy about it was it was the first time where African-American male adults and African-American male young men can get together, unencumbered, free to say what's on their mind without fear of someone being offended or, or someone thinking that we're um, engaging in some type of subversive activity. We're just trying to get these young men to realize their beauty and brilliance and what they can uh, um, inject into the, the greater community in terms of uh, energy, in terms of positivity, in terms of um, becoming the types of Americans that we want all of our young men to be. So I was just excited because that doesn't happen a lot. Uh, we are, yes, African-American males, and we are black, and we need to embrace that. But we shouldn't live up to what people think. We should, we should show how we want to show ourselves. It was nice because you actually got to learn who you really were. Like, some people might discriminate you for your color, and that created, it actually, showed you that you're an outstanding black male. Dr. Ford said, love the skin that you're in. It helped me understand my, basically, like, understand my culture and what we'll, we may have to go through in our lives. Well, to me, it doesn't really matter about the race because I know, like, we all fit in and, like, it really doesn't bother me as a person. It just makes me feel even better about myself. I can be smart, too. And that goes for all stereotypes. Not just the white people are smart or Asians are smart. It goes for everybody. I don't care what anybody says about me. I am who I am. I am who God made me. When we begin to look at a definition of masculinity from the, the nine constructs, we can then begin to see that a male can be someone who has an idea of self, of who he is as a person. It wasn't just a thing we went to over the summer. It was a, it was a bond. It was building on all of our masculinity and everything that we are. Those five days on the grounds of the University of Virginia were about more than learning in the classroom. Exploring university life is critical to building a scholar identity. Visits to the John Paul Jones Sports Arena, the engineering school, and eating in the dining hall sparked the imagination and inspired scholarly behavior. I love how the students were so interactive with us. Sometimes they'll talk to us and ask us questions. And I like how the campus was so ready to have us there. The, um, the cafeteria was nice. I remember the food was good. And the food at the college is really, really good. That was not typical food. That was not typical food. That was like, that was like a beyond food. That was not even food. They had a all you can eat buffet. They had pizza, homemade stuff. They had corn dolls, hot dolls, fri french fries, burgers. They had ice cream. They even had a salad bar. They got all that delicious food, too. I tried some stuff I never thought I'd ever eat, like a grilled cheese with bacon and tomatoes. That was really delicious. Kind of like going there because Definitely, like everybody get all hype, like very hype, and we're all happy to see the arena. And some people like talking about how they wanted to go there and play for that school. And now that they finally got to see the arena, they got even happier, and they said that they def definitely want to go there. You learn new things that you don't know. I know that the program that was started is only the beginning, because underlying that program is a strong belief that we can and we will close the achievement gap because we believe in our students. We um, started every morning with the Scholar's Creed. 
we had seven young men who led us. It was kind of like the um, being in a church, the call and response. I I am a scholar. I am college bound. I will cogitate daily. I am hungry for knowledge and success. I am outstanding black male. I am a leader. My efforts will set me apart. I am an achiever. I will succeed. I am responsible for my own destiny. I am responsible for my own destiny. I am responsible for my own destiny. And I am responsible for my own destiny. I thought that was really great. It motivated me to be like a better scholar and a better person. I am responsible for my own destiny. Yes, I am a scholar, and I am not just a baller. I cogitate daily, call that thinking. And if I don't do good in school, my life will start sinking. Learn how to sacrifice every day. Like when I ask my mom for new shoes, she says, okay. Need to know who I am, where I am, and where I'm going. My life is like a river, it keeps on flowing. So I need to be good and keep on rolling. I need to stay close to my friends and my family because they invest in me. That is the key to find the best that is inside of me. Yes, my name is Amir Wright and I do what's right. I'm a scholar and I am not just a baller.